My name's Alan. Um, I'm going to do a quick intro on myself, and then I'll ask Armand to come up and do a, a quick intro. Um, but today we're going to be talking about F5 and Nginx better together. Um, some of this we heard on main stage from Gus and Cara, uh, and Armand and I are going to dig a little deeper. Unfortunately, we're not going to go really, really deep given the time frame, so we're just going to talk about a couple of architectures, um, how we got to this point, uh, and then we're going to do a demo of using both pieces of technology. So as I mentioned, my name's Alan. Uh, I'm with Nginx, currently based in Sydney. I head up the solution architecture team for Asia. Um, I've been with Nginx for about three and a half years. Prior to that, I was with F5 for 10 years. So this is a big time deja vu for me, but that's all right, it's pretty cool. Um, I'm having a good time. Um, so that's me, and then I'll ask Armand to come up and use this mic to introduce himself. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for having me. My name is Armand, I'm a solutions architect uh, for Nginx. Been with the company for two years, and based out of Denver, so I'll, I'll do a quick demo after Alan does his presentation. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, man. Um, so throughout the presentation, if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand. We've got a microphone. We'll float them around. Um, I'll ask a couple of you know, survey questions as we go, but um, definitely let's keep this interactive, especially since we're the last session of the day. Let's stay awake. Um, let's do this before we all head off to happy hour. So quick question of everybody in the room. Obviously, this is nginx.conf, or nginx.conf, I should say. Um, as Rob mentioned to this morning, the location was based before the acquisition. But that said, how many people in the audience are familiar with F5 technology? OK, it's a good number. A lot of, you know, a lot of overlap there. Um, is anybody actively using nginx with F5 in their architecture today in production? Awesome. One, two, OK. That's a good number, um, and that's encouraging, because we're going to talk about some cool things that you guys may not have thought about before um, and where we can fit together, because um, we get a lot of questions in the field uh, about the solutions. Number one question I get is, why? <laughs> why Ing F5 acquired Nginx? Great question, great question. So I, a little bit of background. This is stuff that we all know. Um, we heard it on main stage today, but I'll summarize. Infrastructure is changing. Um, it is drastically different today than it was three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It's just different. Um, in our world, in the Nginx world prior to acquisition, we work almost exclusively with DevOps. Now, it doesn't have to be a DevOps proper team because that term carries a lot of baggage, but we work with the people who are responsible for delivering code. And that code lives in an infrastructure somewhere, something like Kubernetes, um, based on Docker, running in something like EKS. Um, but that code has infrastructure. And for us, that's our sweet spot. That's kind of the devops -y world that Nginx lives in. Um, it's a really, really nice combination with F5, who has some really, really cool, smart technology that handles high, high volume, um, high secure network traffic to get it into the environment where we play. So when we talk about the, the infrastructure is changing, we've all seen the stats. Um, we saw some great ones from Gus this morning. Oh, wrong direction. But with that change, um, highlights a, a big thing that we all see in the field every day, which is the needs for somebody who's responsible for code and the needs for somebody who's responsible for networking are completely different, right? There's speeds and feeds on the networking side. There's functionality and agility on the DevOps side. So when you look at those two use cases, right, those challenge areas, you start to see that Nginx is good for one, right? It's really, really good for agile, uh, code-based, application-based deployments. And F5 is really, really good for those high volume network, highly secure, um, geo-distributed, as we'll see from Armand in a few minutes. Those type of environments, key to networking, really, really good fit for F5. So when you start to look at them together, it's like, okay, DevOps needs one thing. NetOps needs something else. Is there a way to, to bridge that gap so that the DevOps team isn't trying to solve networking problems and the NetOps team isn't trying to, to solve the app stack problems? And that slide we saw this morning from Gus, code to customer, really, really analogous to this, where we have uh, code on this side, customer on this side. You start with the app server. You have to get it all the way back out your infrastructure through things like security um, and then vice versa. And when we break that down, it's pretty, pretty straightforward down the line right in between that app delivery controller between Nginx and F5. You know, what do we solve really well? What does F5 tech solve really well? Um, and it's it's not a coincidence that the DMARC line is that app delivery controller, because we both have ADCs. Now, they're ADCs for different functions, but they do both provide that same core functionality um, of routing traffic from one thing to another and doing it via a reverse proxy. I would say the number one kind of pushback I've gotten in the field when people ask why, um, the, the follow-up to that is why, because you both have ADCs. You both do load balancing. 
Um, you both provide some of that feature functionality. And that is true, right? There's definitely some overlap. But that's just one tiny, tiny part of the puzzle. Um, the very first thing to ask yourself when you're thinking, is it an F5 solution or an Nginx solution, is what's the platform look like, right? Am I deploying more of a NetOps-oriented platform? Am I deploying for geo distribution? Am I deploying for a front door service, what we call a front door service? Or am I deploying application delivery functionality in a microservice environment, in a containerized environment? Um, am I going multi-cloud, right? Do I want to distribute um, all of my high volume traffic between multiple clouds with F5 DNS? And then do I want to um, handle that traffic as it comes into that micro cloud environment um, with an Nginx solution? So when people say there's overlap, I say, sure, there's overlap, but the functionality of where you deploy that overlap is completely different and completely unique between the two. And as we start to move further on one side versus the other, you start to see there's some very interesting and unique tech that each one of these technologies provide. Um, the ability to do things like integrated east-west traffic management with Nginx, or high volume, high secure um, API security at the edge with F5. So the further you get away from the ADC in the middle, the more unique those solutions and that feature set um, turns out to be. And if we kind of look at some of the stats, because we all like stats and numbers, um, Nginx really is driven from the open source and microservice um, arena. Normally when I give this presentation, it's a little longer and I give a whole background on Nginx for people who aren't familiar. Not necessary in this crowd, given we're at Nginx Conf. So a lot of this stuff you guys know. Um, but I like to reiterate some of those big numbers there, 90 million downloads per year of Nginx open source, and still today the number one um, container downloaded or pulled from Docker Hub. Has been for many, many years, uh, still is today, greater than one billion at this point, which is amazing. Um, and then on the flip side, we've got F5 on the enterprise side. Um, you know, huge presence. Uh, when I was with F5 previously, all we worked with were top 50s. Um, companies around the world. I mean, these are big, big enterprise companies that trust everything um, to their infrastructure. I won't name names, but I was working with a, a bank a few months ago um, who passes 100% of their mobile traffic through F5, and most of that is via a function F5 has called iRules. So people depend on this technology for really, really high volume, high um, dependent type traffic. Uh, so everywhere, I mean, F5 is pervasive. And then kind of... Um, I want to say culturally, or when we look at the actual application, um, you start to see things like Nginx, very, very agile. Um, you love the stat, or we love the stat, I should say, that it can fit on a floppy. It's tiny. You can put it anywhere. You can deploy it in a container. Um, it can do all the same functionality in a, a tiny, tiny 7 meg container that it can do on an 88 core Dell piece of hardware. Um, very, very fast and agile and flexible. Um, and then F5, really, really trusted. Platforms, really, really high volume, as I mentioned before. So that's kind of the background. That's the why. Um, there's a lot more we can talk about here. Happy to kind of talk about it um, during happy hour tonight or throughout the session. Any questions on just kind of the concepts or core before I jump into some architectures? Cool. All right. So let's start looking at a few. Um, the first one I'm going to focus on uh, specifically for Nginx is an API gateway. And if you're familiar with using Nginx as an API gateway, or you already are, you're probably familiar with this use case and these features. Um, but I want to start here as kind of a base so that we're all on the same page. Um, there are a couple of different ways you can deploy API gateway services with Nginx. Um, Kevin Jones just did a great presentation next door on a few of those different models that you guys can watch later if you haven't seen it. Um, but in all of those models, the API gateway functionality is still providing the same core feature set. Um, so when you deploy Nginx Plus as an API gateway, it, we're doing this. We're doing API routing, URL mapping, authentication, everything that you would expect from an API gateway. But a traditional deployment is to deploy some form of API gateway as the connections are coming in, right? The front door ingress service. Um, I was working with a customer a few weeks ago that has about 650 million connections per, uh, per month. I'm sorry, not per second. That would be amazing. Um, 650 million uh, API calls per month. And it's a relatively low volume, right? It sounds like a big number, but it's not. It's kind of a, a standard market number um, that they use. And they initially deployed uh, in this model. But what they found is the more that they distributed their microservices behind, the more that they wanted to segment that traffic pattern. So instead of handling 650 in one location, they wanted to distribute out those calls based on function. Um, those functions are owned by specific teams. So the team that is responsible for shipping has one API set. The one that's responsible for inventory has another. Um, this was a postal service we were working with. 
So when we talk about API Gateway, we usually start here, but then we start digging into, well, maybe there's a different architecture and there's a different better way to do it. And with F5, there's a much better way to do it because we can now control and own the API lifecycle at the network level. So we talk a lot about API management lifecycle. We're talking a lot about it at the show today. Usually people talk about it from the dev perspective, which is spot on. But in this case, I'm talking about more of the networking side. So owning that API lifecycle uh, at the network. So with F5, just, this is just an example. All of these are just examples uh, to kind of get you thinking. When traffic comes in, um, the very first thing that handles that API call in is going to be an F5 piece of tech. Um, and this is going to allow you to do some really, really good things. One is geo distribution, so GSLB. Um, you can make a regional based decision or distribute to different locations based on DNS. Um, and then the next two are security. So high security, high volume WAF. F5 has a couple of solutions that do that. Um, but they also have a very specific solution on API security that can do things like ingest swagger. Uh, policies and profiles, so open API. So they can provide that very front door level of security that says, is this API endpoint even allowed? Is it coming from the right location? Does it meet the right criteria? Um, is the JSON payload the right size? You can do all of that evaluation very, very fast at the front door. Once you get past that first door kind of bouncer level security, then you go back and start getting into the API gateway model that I showed you on the previous slide. And this allows you to start doing deeper analytics, deeper routing, deeper security um, on the traffic that you've already deemed as good. And this is where you can do things like JOT authentication and claims data consumption. So you can get the API in and say, okay, the API has been blessed by a five, all is good. Now we're gonna use a JOT to authenticate it. We're gonna consume the claims data and then we're gonna make a load balancing or a routing decision based on the information in that JOT. Um, you can start doing that and distribute it into your traffic environment. And then for Nginx, that traffic environment can be anywhere. It can be a microservice. Um, it can be a heavily divested microservice, like a Kubernetes environment or EKS. Um, or it can be multi-cloud. Um, it can be traditional data center. Really doesn't matter to us. Um, but the important part is that we're doing that second level API management that you need once things come in. And then the theme this week is controller. So all of those instances can be managed by controller, which does configuration management for APIM as well as deep, deep analytics um, and allows you to scale those instances wherever you'd, you'd like to go. And then down here, as we've talked about this week, um, we're opening up some new APIs to controller um, to give you visibility um, into that environment. F5 also has some APIs um, that you can use to consume metrics-based data um, as well and integrate that at the same time. I'm um, using one of these tools such as AppDynamics, uh, Grafana with Prometheus, New Relic, ServiceNow, et cetera. This is probably the most common use case um, we've worked on in the past three months since acquisition. Um, this is the one that seems to be uh, the most interesting and the most eye-catching, where people immediately look at it and say, okay, I get this, this makes sense. Um, they are different technologies, they are doing different things, but they're highly complementary. Any questions on API Gateway together before we move on to the next one? Cool, easy, I like this. Everybody's ready for beer. Let's see what we're doing for time. Yeah, we're good. We have plenty of time. Um, so the next one we're going to talk about is ingress controller. Uh, is anybody in the room running Kubernetes even remotely in production? One, two, three. OK. Um, of the four of you, uh, are you using uh, an ingress controller that you're managing, meaning you added? OK, good. One, one OK. Yeah. Um, so those who may not be familiar with Kubernetes and ingress controllers, um, ingress controller is basically the network management tool for layer seven traffic coming in. It does a lot more, but that's kind of the, the really five second version. Um, with Kubernetes, Nginx open source is the default uh, ingress controller. So if you download Kubernetes and you just fire it up, you're gonna be using open source for ingress most likely, unless you change it. Um, but Nginx as a company also creates two different ingress controllers that you can use instead. One is also based on open source, uh, completely free, but we've exposed additional features and annotations that are different. Um, and then there's the Nginx Plus ingress controller, which can do a, a ton of stuff um, that open source can't quite do. There are sessions here about ingress controller. Unfortunately, I think we're overlapping with uh, one of them about the next gen ingress controller, but please uh, watch it online. Ingress controller, using Nginx Plus for an ingress controller, very, very common use case for any of our customers who are using Kubernetes. Um, we talk about it all the time. Um, now that we talk about kind of the integration with F5, then even though it looks like I just threw an F5 ball on top of that line, I promise it's really doing something. It's not just there for looks. 
Um, but a microservice environment still needs to get traffic somehow. Um, and with F5, or I'm sorry, with Nginx, we always get asked the question, well, how do I get traffic into it, especially if I want to build my system on-prem and then move it to something like ECS, where I'm still managing my own cluster, I'm still managing my own containers, I'm just doing it somewhere else. How do I direct traffic? How do I route traffic? How do I get traffic into that? And historically, the answer from Nginx is, well, we're a load balancer, so you can point any DNS endpoint to us you want. You just have to do it somewhere else, and then we'll take it from there, and then we'll deliver it to your ingress controller. And with F5, we just have a little better um, alignment to do that with those F5 technologies I talked about in the API gateway. Um, a lot of our customers, especially in the Asia region, region um, and ANZ in, particu in particular, are already using F5 as front door load balancers. They're already using them for L4 and L7 to get traffic in. So it's a perfect opportunity to start talking about using Nginx Plus as ingress once the traffic comes in. So pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, it's nothing crazy. It's just talking about how do you manage your layer 4 to layer 7 traffic before ingress, um, which is a thing. This is also a really, really good opportunity um, when we go in and talk to people to talk about the difference between NetOps and DevOps, because this is usually the DevOps team, and that's usually the NetOps team. Um, so even though they're separate silos, they're separate buckets, uh, we can talk about how we can work together and get traffic between the two. Um, any questions on ingress controller? Cool. All right. You guys are too easy. And then this one is my favorite slide. Um, so this, <laughs> I kind of just want to sit for 30 seconds and let you digest it. You know, just soak it in, soak it in. So I'll, I'll give you the backstory on this. Um, this is tr a real customer's architecture. I mean, this is not made up. This is 100% real. Um, it's a very, very large enterprise customer, not based in the US. Um, very, very big environment. Um, but they also, not only do they have their own inf internal infrastructure, but they have a separate branch of their company that functions as an MSP, basically. Um, they do a lot more than that, but that's, that's kind of the high level. So they create um, these environments that they then resell to other customers to consume extra resources in their own environment. Um, so we sat down with an F5 SE, um, really, really smart guy, uh, and created this kind of dream architecture using what they already have today. So the customer already has these buckets allocated. They're already using F5 for front door services. They're already using Nginx for every possible feature that we could ever want them to. Um, Nginx is everywhere in this environment. So we sat down and said, well, let's draw this together. Let's see what this would look like if we built one environment. Um, and then let's go talk to the team who owns this. Now, in this particular company, a different team owns each bucket. So we've only talked to two of them so far. It's going to be a long process. Um, but we're getting there. And you can kind of see in every different function, you first start with that platform conversation. So what's the platform, right? We're not just talking about layer 4 and layer 7 traffic at the front door. And we're not just talking about microservice. We're talking about a running environment for a function. So in this case, we have a microservice PaaS um, that they're running in AWS. It has its own VPC. But they have um, very sophisticated and important services that run in that environment. So they want to add things like security, specifically rate limiting, um, and DDoS protection. That's the big one for that particular environment. But Nginx Plus is running as an ingress controller there. So let's talk about what that looks like and what each function is doing. So we went through and we said, in this one environment, these are the three things Nginx Plus is doing. These are the three things F5 is doing. Over here, we did the same thing. Excuse me. In their managed tenant VPC, they're using managed F5 virtual instances, which is a virtual version of the F5 Big IP hardware, plus Nginx Plus instances for API Gateway. All of the Nginx Plus instances are currently manageable by controller. They're not yet, um, but they are manageable by controller, which gives them full visibility and insight into all those environments. But it also gives them the ability to quickly spin up and manage instances anywhere in that environment. And using all kinds of different things in controller that we've seen today and that we'll see tomorrow, they can do things like tag the internet VPC instances via controller as front facing, so those can never have certain services exposed. They can only have port 80, for example. Um, but back here, for ingress, you have a completely different environment that depends on different ports, and those can be exposed differently. Um, now, controller can't manage all of these today. For example, it doesn't manage ingress controller yet, but all of that stuff is, is right around the corner and coming pretty quickly. Um, and then uh, the last thing I'll mention up here just briefly is that F5 has a, a service mesh technology called Aspen Mesh, which is running um, in a very specific version of this client's environment. Cool.
All right, well, before I turn it over to uh, Armand to talk about a real world use case, any other questions or any questions about this architecture in general? Yes. The microphone. Yeah. It does seem like uh, you are using FI as a network load balancer mm -hmm. uh, with uh, some security cap security capabilities and yes. also WAF. I mean, uh, and engine nginx uh, as a you know API gateway or ingress controller uh, or you know fr front end for a microservice based yep. applications, right? So you you also mentioned that uh, F anything related to FI is a uh, NetOps, anything related to Nginx is DevOps, right? Mm -hmm. So is there any way that as an FA admin or as an Nginx admin, we can collaboratively combine both of them together, manage as a single team? You know, most likely, you know, yes. there were they, yeah. there are a lot of admins here. So we really want to catch up on Nginx uh, and vice versa, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, what are the opportunities there uh, yeah. in terms of, you know, collaborating both the technologies together yep. and manage them. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. That's a good question, and I'll be really quick so I can give kind of some time to Armand. Um, so the short answer is yes, there are technologies that we're working on that give that visibility and that manageability together. Um, but the, the important part is that while Nginx is typically DevOps and F5 is typically NetOps, they're not isolated to those environments. Um, because of some of that feature overlap, especially in the ADC, there can be opportunities or places where Nginx is being managed by a, a NetOps team, and we do it all the time, we've done it for years. And likewise, F5 is embedded with DevOps teams for things like Service Mesh. Um, they have an ingress controller that functions a little differently called CIS. Um, so there is some overlap there, but yes, you're, you're spot on. That's exactly what we're kind of thinking, is how to integrate those on the management plane, control plane. Yeah. Cool, all right, well, I'm gonna remove my laptop here and give it to Armand. Cool, so with the time left, I'd like to give a real world example of how Nginx and F5 are better together. So first of all, set the scene. You guys have two seconds. Two seconds is exactly what half your users expect your web pages to load, in or less. If your web pages load in you know, over four seconds, very likely you're gonna have a big drop off in users visiting your website. And when it comes to mobile experience, we expect about the same experience uh, to, to that of a, a desktop browser experience. Um, only one second more uh, at five seconds, users accessing your web applications through a mobile web browser will start abandoning, abandoning your website. So web performance is, is very performant, uh, important, right? And then it's 2019 and humans apparently have less of a attention span than goldfish, so they say, right? So the biggest contributing factor to web performance is actually latency. So no matter how optimized your website is, how small it is, um, you know, where you structure the HTML with the CSS at top and the JavaScript at the bottom, et cetera, latency still is gonna play the biggest part to your, to your load times. And that's because you can't really change physics, right? So, you know, uh, I researched and found out that 20 milliseconds of round trip time is roughly the same as light traveling 3,000 kilometers in a vacuum. Uh, some other examples is, you know, Boston to San Francisco is about 80 milliseconds. Beijing to Chicago is 200 milliseconds. And Cape Town to Singapore is around about 500 milliseconds of uh, round trip time. So web applications today, web pages are very media rich a feature rich, right? Uh, you know, I, I looked at the inspect button on Chrome on CNN.com and there were roughly 700 pieces of content. So if you take a look at the internet on the left there, that's basically 500 to 700 round trips from my browser all the way to wherever that content is stored, back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. So it's a big problem. Um, if you think about traditional F5 and Nginx solutions, they belong at the data center. So F5 and Nginx are your, your load balancer. Uh, they provide load balancing, web application firewall security, do some proxy caching there, some caching. Um, and at the back end where your web servers live, Nginx can be a web server or an application server with Nginx unit. Now, what I'm 
would like to share with you uh, with my short presentation here is that we could use Nginx and F5 to be your CDN. So if you're not familiar with what a CDN is, a CDN is a content delivery network. Uh, if you, you know, very likely everyone in this room, um, you know, your business, your organization is using a CDN of some sort. Um, Akamai, Limelight, Max CDN, Fastly, Instart Logic, these are just some names in the CDN space. Um, and most of them, if not all, are using Nginx under the hood. So as we saw in the previous uh, presentation with Bruno up here, he demonstrated the power of Nginx as a, a caching proxy. The, the different direct directives and the granular, uh, I guess, configuration that you can do with Nginx as a, as a caching proxy brings much power. And so the DIY or do-it-yourself CDN solution is simply Nginx as a cache proxy deployed up in the cloud and F5's DNS, so GSLB, GTM, uh, whether that's on the big IP or the you know, F5's cloud services, is providing the GSLB capability. And so the better together solution looks something like this. So how it works is that you can deploy Nginx essentially anywhere where Linux can be installed. So that could be on any private infrastructure it can be on any public uh, cloud service. So it could, you, know, you could deploy Nginx on Azure, DigitalOcean, AWS, GCP. Um, and as a user makes a request, uh, the F5 DNS will resolve, uh, you know, respond back with an A record of an IP address to a server closest to the end user. Um, and that's where the Nginx cache proxy lives, where it has cached already the content uh, from the origin server, which could be anywhere. And so uh, I, I created a, a quick POC. And basically what I did is I deployed Nginx on every availability zone in DigitalOcean on the very smallest uh, VPC. I used F5's DNS big IP uh, virtual appliance up on AWS. I have my content in San Francisco, and I also have the Nginx controller to do uh, monitoring of my CDN uh, network, uh, my cache network. And the results were amazing. So you can see that the typical uh, load time reduction was anywhere between uh, you know, 50% to 85%. The further you go away from the origin server, which is San Francisco, the greater the, the load time reduction was. So, uh, from New York, East Coast to the West Coast, I was able to reduce the load time to 50%. From Singapore to San Francisco, I was able to reduce the load time by 85%. And this is running on infrastructure which costs me uh, less than 40 bucks a month. This is just a demo, right? So obviously you could deploy your own CDN, um, I guess, uh, network using a, a service provider such as Akamai or or, you know, Max CDN, Cloudflare, or whatever, right? But there, there comes some potential problems with a commercial CDN solution. Uh, first of all, it's expensive. Um, it can get very expensive. Um, we've had some use cases and some customers who have gone off commercial CDNs because they could save million dollars a month um, on a solution such as this. Um, sometimes a CDN solution that's uh, provided by a vendor doesn't fit all use cases. Sometimes you don't have a points of presence in countries that you have people. You know, I've talked to um, some customers that needed a CDN point of presence in the Bahamas or Jamaica or Togo, right? And these aren't your typical um, high trafficked places where say Akamai has a points of presence, just as an example. So with something like, an, like this solution, um, you don't necessarily need to replace your CDN, but you could augment it or supplement it. So maybe spin up Nginx in a, in a particular geolocation where you don't have uh, points of presence uh, from your CDN solution. So I'll, I'll just go through, just through, go through a demo uh, of some of the things. Let's see if I have to work off this big screen. Okay. 
So this is uh, before and after using web page test. Um, this is the 85% reduction that we saw um, on that last slide. So first of all, the load time was 16 seconds, as, as you can see from Singapore. Um, we're missing some things like compressing content, running it through Nginx cache proxy. I was also able to enable HTTP2. I was also able to enable compression. A lot of things at the edge to help boost performance. Um, and as a result, I got A's across the board. I'm getting an X on uh, using a CDN because web page test doesn't know that I'm actually using my own CDN. Um, and so I was able to get the reduce, you know, load times down to 85% faster, uh, which is awesome. The GSLB configuration on F5 is actually very straightforward. Um, and, you know, I, I saw a show of hands before on how many people are familiar using Big IP, so that's awesome. So this will make sense to you. I actually had to learn this this week that, you know, I, I, I created regions and you know, some rules saying if, re, you know, if a request came from the Americas region, I'm gonna to route to the US data center. If the region was Asia Pacific, then route them to Singapore um, and so on. So that's simply the, uh, the GSLB configuration. Um, and as you can see, not lying, you know, here locally in Seattle, my nearest CDN pop is in New York and that's where I'm basically gripping the headers, which I'm advertising the name or the location of that CDN node, which is New York. Um, and if I do the same in my different cache nodes, you can see that each location around the world is, is routed to the nearest CDN uh, node. Some of the cool features that I can use with Nginx as well uh, to you know, help the manageability of my CDN cluster is like I could do, a, I could use the cache purge API on Nginx. Um, I could also utilize the mirror feature in Nginx so that if I make a cache purge request to one node, I can mirror that request to all my CDN nodes in my network and that way I could purge something instantly from my cache. So here you go, just a bit of a cache purge request um, and I was able to purge the fav icon globally. And just to check that that is working, fingers crossed, I get a miss, I get a miss and I get a hit. So my rules are basically saying my Nginx configuration is that I'll cache it after X number of requests. In this case, it was, it was two. So as you can see, I purged it globally. I was able to prime the cache again. Uh, the very last feature is that I can use the Nginx sync to sync my configuration as well. So uh, Nginx Plus has a uh, Nginx sync or configuration sync feature. So I can actually push my configurations to one node, hit the sync button, and it's gonna sync my, my certificates, it's gonna sync my Nginx configurations, it can sync whatever is on that system that I, I choose to, to sync. So we have all the tools between the F5 and the Nginx portfolio to build your own uh, CDN network. Lastly, of course, I have to include the controller. And here is my custom dashboard, which is like my, my, my single view to my CDN network, which I can see the cache hit per second, the miss per second, bypass, and so on. So here what I'm seeing is that I'm getting a really good cache hit. I'm getting 900 hits per second to my cache, and I'm getting less than you know, point three requests per second, it's, it's missing, right? Um, obviously there are some items that I would never want to cache and that, that's represented in that stat there. Um, and then, you know, just to show sort of the, the reach of the controller as well, I've got the controller talking to my cache nodes distributed around the world um, without any problem as well. So as, as you can see in Singapore, as the day is getting started, traffic's ramping up. And in New York, where the day is ending, traffic is ramping down. So do you have it better together? That was awesome. Thanks. Cool. Well, thanks, Armand. That was seriously cool. Um, yeah, well, that's about it. Um, any questions? Anything we want to talk about CDN that Armand built or just general tech? All right, too easy. All right. All right. Thanks, oh, guys. Oh, oh, got one. Yep. So, uh, 
Nice save. Any kind of restriction on the file type for cache? The file type? Yeah. Any, just wonder if there is any restriction which files the, the cache can hold. Um, no, there's no restriction. Um, so Nginx has really the flexibility to, I mean, by default, it will follow the cache directives from the back end, right? So if something from the back end, the web server says, hey, I'm an image, I'm cacheable for one day, Nginx will cache it for one day. But you also have the, the flexibility to override that as well. So to your question, there is no restriction on what is cacheable. If it is cacheable, Nginx will cache it. If it's not cacheable, Nginx can override that cache directive and cache it anyway. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility there. Oh, it's one more question. I'm uh, new to Nginx, but uh, so sorry if this is obvious, but is there any reason why you chose config sync between the, the plus devices as opposed to the configuration option in the controller? Okay, so the controller, we have a couple of modules there. One is load balancing and the other one is API management. Uh, what we don't have there is some sort of caching module. So we can't actually do, we can't actually, I guess, tap into the full capabilities of Nginx's caching capability through the controller. So I'm just using controller for monitoring only. All right, last go, yeah. Uh, how do I use, sorry. Because you're using config sync, mm -hmm. how do you handle the, uh, the IP addresses in the different areas, or do you just use DNS? Uh, is this for, for your config? For my, for my config? Yeah. Uh, so each of my in, my, in my very simple demo, I have four nodes scattered around the world, and they, they all have access to each other. If it's, if it's, I'm just doing direct IP address. It's all just resolvable, yeah. But in terms of GSLB, I'm, I am doing DNS. I'm using F5 to filter out the DNS response and send back the appropriate DNS response, the, the, the IP address which is closest to the, the user request. But was your question also about Nginx config? On like how do you, yeah, so I think he was asking like how do you bind server to, to I assume you're just doing listen 80. Yeah, 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 yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. Yep. So just doing a listen and then a port number without an IP address, and it will just bind to the IP address that's there. Mm. Yeah, so then you can use the same yep. config everywhere. Yeah. So how would you handle how different mechanisms you have? Oh, OK. Right, 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 yeah. right. Yeah. OK, so I, I get you. So my, I can actually show you my Nginx config, right? If I take a look at my, say, my example website, which is uh, watches galore, um, I'm, a, I'm actually not listening on a specific IP address. So DNS is going to take care of that IP address. Uh, you know, th it's going to point to my Nginx uh, node. I'm listening just on a server name. Mm -hmm. So it's up here. Yep. So when I do sync it, there's nothing specific, right? So I'm, I'm localhost 80 and IP, uh, DNS name. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks so much, everybody, for spending the end of the afternoon with us. Uh, we'll see you tonight and back tomorrow. Thank you.